we like to do now is just share with you. It's a personal odyssey, really. It's not a descriptive or definitive history of anything. It's personal, but it's parallel to things that did develop because we were at a certain place at a certain time. We were very fortunate uh, to be there. I think anybody who was in the Sinai in the 70s and the 80s and the age of discovery feel, feels blessed to have been part of that. It was an area that, which you'll see soon, which was relatively unexplored from the outside world, the tip of uh, Israel and uh, the Red Sea. And here, actually, in the picture, you can see my thin self getting ready to go for uh, my first uh, submersion into the Red Sea. And I would like to say that ever since, my, my life had, would change forever. I went back to the States. I finished my degree and came back to Israel in 1970, exactly 50 years ago. And I fulfilled a dream that I would do something in my life that I really love to do, not had to do. And I opened the diving center. Uh, crazy, huh? One of the first, there was maybe the second one in all of Israel. And this was the opening ceremony on the Mediterranean shore. I called it the Mediterranean Diving Center, a very original name. And um, this was the opening ceremony in 1970. Immediately we began to do deal with diving instruction because this is a new sport and you have to bring people into it. This is 1970, mind you, and this is really at the genesis of diving. Um, and so we had a school and it was quite successful teaching people to dive, but it's not enough just to teach people to dive. You have to be given something to do after they learn. So we began organizing like beach dives off of the beach, not the best diving conditions in the world, I must say. And, but I mean, good enough and people were very excited at the time. And this was before really diving tourism took off. So just to get under the water, blow bubbles and maybe see a fish or two, uh, that was exciting enough. So here we are on the beach. Um, I did have an opportunity to do a little commercial work. And I went out with some uh, investors who wanted to start a, a sponge business like sponge diving. Um, they decided they wanted to do it in Gaza because they thought it was the closest to North Africa, Tunisia, where they had, or Egypt, where they had sponge, uh, sponge uh, industry. So they hired me to go out and dive looking for sponges. I was not so successful, truthfully, finding any sponges, but I was successful in discovering a shipwreck, which, call, which was the discovery of the Farouk. The uh, Emir Farouk was the flagship of the Egyptian Navy that was sunk in 1948 in the uh, war between Israel, Egypt, and the Arab countries um, by a human torpedo. Literally, a man went in the water and launched this thing into the broadside of the of the ship, and it sank. And nobody knew where it was, or nobody had dived on it, to my knowledge, until we found it uh, by chance. And um, so I got really excited. I contacted my friends. And um, my colleague Pilo, who been diving with me for 50 years, and we went down, we organized a group to go down and dive and to photograph the wreck underwater. And this is kind of a cool picture because those of you who know the Middle East now, this is June 5th, 1972, uh, 48 years ago. June 5th was the an fifth anniversary of the of what they call the Six Day War, the war between Israel and Egypt, where Israel actually captured Gaza and the Sinai. So to show up at uh, this day in 1972, exact that day, with a rubber boat to go diving was kind of bizarre, to say the least, if not downright dangerous. But here you can actually see me in the middle of all this, launching the boat off the shore. Anyway. Beyond that, what was really happening, the story was the Sinai. The Sinai was just um, captured by Israel, like I said, in 67. For three years, there was a war of attrition along the Suez Canal, which you can see here uh, on the left side of the screen. And like nothing was really happening. But once it was over, the, uh, and, and there was a ceasefire, then um, Israel started to construct a road along the shoreline of the Gulf of Aqaba, which you see on the right here, I mean, or in the middle of this picture, on the right of the Sinai. 
And once that road was completed, uh, by the way, you can then all of a sudden go into the Sinai once the road was completed and see scenes like this, which were out of a thousand and one nights. This is the Bedouin of the Sinai in the beautiful landscape of the area, mountainous, granite mountains, spectacular. Um, and these are the things that we saw on the first views. Um, we went along the coastline and about an hour's drive south of Eilat, which was the Israeli city in the, on the Red Sea, we went, uh, we, um, the, we set up our first base camp. Uh, uh, this was the construction camp for the people that were building the road between Eilat and Sharim. And once the road was completed, they left, and a group of young Israeli um, idealists uh, set up a cooperative, actually, like something like we call the Moshav, but it was uh, to, for tourism, though, and some agriculture, at the, using the same structures. And they set up a little uh, guest house there, and we were needing a place to have a base for our customers who needed to do uh, open water work. So it was a perfect synergy, and we set up uh, we set up our camp here. We set up our base in a little shack on the beach, and this was our extension of our Mediterranean diving center, which is poorly named for the Red Sea. So we had to think about that soon. But this was our base here, and we they did courses along the water uh, on the beach. Uh, here's a kind of a typical scene: our students, our chief instructor Svika here uh, on the left, and uh, Bedouin walking by with a camel on the beach. So it was kind of, uh, uh, say, extremes that we were we had. But once we finished these things, we wanted to continue into the Sinai to explore more, to see more, to understand more. And we took this new road that was just finished deeper into the Sinai along the south. And the things we saw were spectacular and very interesting. First of all, we saw a lot of um, objects of war because there was a war there. And in, in truth, this area was historically a battleground. It was in the middle between the two empires, one of Egypt, the other of Mesopotamia, and armies would be going back from time immemorial. And the truth of the matter is, and this is kind of an important point for, for me to share, that this historical, from time immemorial battleground was transmission, trans, uh, transiting into what we would call an international playground. And we were the players. We were the ones that were making this happen. And that, for me, was a very exciting part of my life. At the southern tip, we came into a beautiful bay we call Marsa Breka. And here we found literally four Egyptian tanks on the shore. Um, and it was kind of crazy, you know, where here we are going, going scuba diving and there's four tanks abandoned, of course, for five years. But we, um, we actually used the tanks, gave it a good purpose and kind of symbolic. We covered the turrets and the cannons with our wetsuits to dry between dives. And maybe that was a symbolic of a new day. Also, we, we found some missiles and if some of you could look to the right of the picture, take your mind over to the right and look at the Hawk missile. This is a phony, it's not the real thing. It was a Demi, uh, Demi base that was set up um, just to, uh, in case there was ever any attack, they would go after the false missiles and not the real missiles. Uh, I had other captions for this picture, but I decided in the, might be children watching, so I just, just put photo op for divers. Um, by the way, the guy who took the picture, of that picture is named Brett Gilliam. He's a dear friend and he's watching from Maine right now in the United States. Hi, Brett. Um, so we ended up going down to Sharm el Sheikh, which uh, we moved the operation to the south because the diving was simply better. And this is the Bay of Sharm el Sheikh. See if you could kind of remember this image in your mind, because we'll get to it later on as it develops. But at the time, there was one hotel, which is called the Caravan Hotel. And there was uh, my diving center and another diving center on this side, which belonged to a Swiss gentleman. And that was it. That was Charm in 1973. 
the caravan hotel, which was the one hotel, was basically caravans, which means little trailers. In parts of the world, they're called caravans, and they are driven down from Elad, put on this beach, and those were the rooms of the hotel. There was an inflatable tent, and um, and 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 that was the dining room, and that was the hotel. And just on beyond it, on the beach, they dumped a train car, which became the first train car diving center in the world. And this was Red Sea, well, not, ultimately became Red Sea Divers. At the time, we hadn't given the name, but shortly we will. Um, and my residence was this there on the left, one of the caravans. And as you can imagine, I didn't have much of a tran trans uh, commute to, from work to from house to work in the morning and definitely no traffic jams. But right on the sand, there wasn't even a floor yet. The, the floor was the, the, was the sand. Um, we, we bought a surplus Jeep from the military, painted it orange and blue and used it for carrying the tanks and, and the equipment uh, back and forth to the dive sites. And if we ever got stuck, of course, we had the usual Sinai towing service off on the right to pull us out. Eventually, we also got a few skips, a few locally made boats, that, I mean, boats that we actually brought down from the north. Um, and those were boats that we used to take the divers uh, out to the local sites. And then basically Red Sea Divers was born. So for Mediterranean Diving Center, logically, we went to the Red Sea Divers, uh, the graphic, was also the cover of a wonderful book called Red Sea Divers Guide, which uh, my dear friend Shlomo Cohen uh, made and I photographed most of it. And that became also our logo and our flyer and that was it. In 1972, we had our first group of adventurous, maybe halfway crazy American divers who came from all over the United States uh, through a company called Bay Travel. They were the one of the pioneer dive operations. We worked with all of, eventually, all of the big uh, operators out of the United States, Bay Travel, CNC Travel, La Mer Travel, and my friend Amos Nahum. But this was the first group. They came off the plane wearing steel helmets, thinking they were coming into a war zone and it wasn't far from the truth. I think they were mostly overcome not only by the Red Sea diving, but also the spacious deck space that we had on our dive boat. It was room, room galore. As a matter of fact, that was a cardinal rule in all of our operations in those years is to have plenty of room on our dive boats. No, no problem moving around. Eventually we managed to get in 1975, and when I say we, I had by the partner, an uh, officer from the Israeli Navy named uh, Yossi. And we got this boat from Cyprus. It was a fishing boat. And we um, converted it into a dive boat. It was 39 feet. It had a little cabin. We could have a little head in there and uh, so much room you can, can't imagine. But that was our first boat. Shortly after, we got a second boat called, ironically, Red Sea Diver 2. So we, are, we had the beginning of a fleet of dive boats taking people a little farther afield than the skiffs and a little more comfortably. Unfortunately, sometimes the dive boat becomes a dive site. And one morning when we got to the diving center, we just basically saw this ladder floating up to the surface and the dive boat wasn't there anymore. But we did a salvage job, got it up, cleaned it up, and sure enough, we had it ready to go. So this was the Red Sea Divers fleet at the time, and it allowed us to get to the really great dive sites that surrounded the area. The first one and most famous being Ras Muhammad. Ras Muhammad, the head of Muhammad the Prophet, rumor has it, or um, let's say legacy has it, that this mound here on the right side uh, is they call Muhammad's head. And this supposedly was where Muhammad came from Saudi Arabia across the way, came to Ras Muhammad, and with his charger, his, his horse, Barak, he continued on to Jerusalem, but then he ascended to heaven. So this has some kind of a symbolic meaning by all means. And uh, I'd just like to say to our guests from 
Egypt, friends of ours and colleagues and other uh, parts of the Muslim world, uh, Ramadan Karim. Anyway, Ras Muhammad is truly one of the great dive sites of the Middle East or anywhere in the world for that matter. And uh, this picture was taken by my dear friend, David Dubele in the National Geographic story, which we'll get to shortly. The other great spot is the Tehran Straits, which are these four islands, Gordon, Thomas, Woodhouse, and Jackson. These are four submerged coral reefs. And they make up the Straits of Tehran. That's Tehran Island there, originally belonging to Egypt, then taken over by Israel in 67. And now I understand it's gone back to Saudi control. Saudi Arabia is here, OK? This is a convergence between Asia and Africa, right here in the Sinai. Egypt being in Africa, Saudi Arabia being in Asia, and we're in the meeting point. The, the Red Sea proper is here on the right, and the Strait of Tehran leading into Aqaba Bay, Aqaba Gulf. So we had a diving center, we had a boat, we had cars, we had great diving, but we needed tourists. So to get tourists, you have to work. You got to go and get them. So in 1973, Sharon, my wife and I went off to the United States and Europe to do a marketing tour, first of many, many. I'm still doing them. And we were in Los Angeles and in Long Beach, very close to where I grew up. And we went attended a show. Now, we got some support with the uh, Israeli airline and we were able to put up a booth. <clears throat> You can even see a little carousel slide projector here with a screen. Unfortunately, the day before when the show began, a Libyan airliner wandered into Israeli airspace over the Sinai and um, was shot down. And that was the headline of the LA Times the day the exhibition opened. And it was really crazy. I'm just going to take a sip of something because my Throat is getting a little froggy, excuse me. Thank you. You think it's soda, right? No. Okay, so on this tour, I ended up in Boston at the Sea Rover Conference in 1973. And I was invited to speak there and make a presentation. Um, at this conference, the guest of honor or the lead speaker was Jacques Cousteau, my childhood hero. And I couldn't believe that I was following him onto the stage to give a presentation on the Red Sea. The guest of honor for the show was Dr. Eugenie Clark. Dr. Eugenie Clark was the shark lady, one of the most famous uh, scientists and sea people in the world ever, in my mind, and my mentor. And we met at that show with two young underwater photographers named David and Anne Dubele, And they wanted to go to the Red Sea. And here I was with my slideshow. So they approached me at the show and they said, well, we'd like to come to the Red Sea. And this is 1973. I said, I'm sorry, we don't accept National Geographic. It doesn't have a big enough circulation. No, no, really. <clears throat> I said that, yeah, sure, why not? So they said a, a, a date for 1973. <clears throat> And unfortunately, in 1973, in October, there was another war. And that's kind of a story that we lived in this part of the world. Just as everything was looking great, boom, a war comes, and you're back to ground zero. So that trip was, the war was the Yom Kippur War, by the way. And that pushed back this trip a year. But 1974, true to the word, Dr. Eugenie Clark, David Dubele on his first official assignment for National Geographic. And uh, his partner at the time, uh, Anne Dubele, um, came and did the first story um, for, for the Red Sea. This is just, by the way, just want to show some of the articles that came out. But the first National Geographic story covering diving in the Red Sea was done. Uh, in 1974, like I said, Dr. Eugenie Clark was the writer. Uh, David and Anne were the photographers. This is some of the gear. Now, this gear, we had never seen anything like it in our lives. If we had one person bought a Nikonos, it was a big event. 
uh, at that time. But to see this gear was mind boggling. So this is, um, this is the David and Jeannie a little later on, but just a picture of them together with some of the gear. I was officially the schlepper. I carried the gear from place to place underwater, and that was my job. But it was an honor to be a schlepper. <clears throat> two garden eels, two, not garden eels, but two white eels in a lot became the first ever cover for David Dubla in National Geographic. Come, consequently, David is the most successful, uh, prolific photographer, writer in the history of National Geographic. I don't know, he's probably got 70 articles by now, I don't know for sure, that he did, photographed and many written. But this was his first, and this was his first cover, and I'm very proud to have been part of that. Um, I'm part of it because I was a model in that story. You can notice the legs there. They're a little different today, but this was a picture taken in uh, 1974, and it's a picture that's gone a long way. First of all, it was in the story, which was great. Second of all, it became a dem promo cover for National Geographic and went all around the world, posters all around the world. But perhaps more bizarrely, this image was launched into space. And how did that happen? Um, there was, in 1977, there was a, a probe into space called the Voyager. And it was the first interstellar foray out of the solar system. And for that, they decided, I guess it was NASA, NASA to put in a time capsule, taking stuff from the 1970s of, of the Earth, put it in a capsule and launch it and whatever extraterrestrial terrestrial being finds it someday will open it up and say, ah, that was life in America, 1970. So there was an international competition for, um, for something underwater. And they asked underwater photographers at the time to submit pictures. Well, David submitted the picture of me in the cave. And sure enough, in a book called Murmurs from Earth, which recorded this um, expedition by Carl Sagan, there, by the way, um, my picture is there because I'm in that time capsule, which means I am orbiting, right? I'm not orbiting. I was told now I'm in a trajectory. I'm not orbiting, but I'm moving past the solar system and into dark space where I'm gonna live forever. So Corona virus or no Corona virus, I'm out there floating around. And that was 1977, sorry. Um, another thing that came out of that, that wonderful trip was David handed me a camera because I, I dreamt of having an underwater camera. And after three months of diving night and day and day and night and whatever, David handed me a Nikonos, which was like a Mercedes for me, and said, why don't you start taking pictures? Here's a bunch of film, take pictures, you're here. But first take a picture of me because Camera Magazine wants a picture of me. So I took a picture of David at a cave and that was it, I forgot about it. Six months later, I get a telegram because they were using telegrams then and it said, congratulations, you have the cover of Camera Magazine and there's a check for $500 on the way. And I said, this is a career calling. You know, I don't wanna tell you how many years it took me until I had another cover, but that's beside the point. One second, a drink. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway, this was the first story of many. We, I think we did seven or eight stories together, mostly in the Red Sea, Dr. Eugenie Clark, David and my friend David, dear friend David Friedman, uh, the naturalist from Eilat came down to join us. And we did many stories. This is one about ecology. <clears throat> it's one about sharks. It's one about preservation of sharks. Today, it's getting more fashionable and, and rightfully so to talk about shark protection, shark conservation. But this is going in back into the 1970s. There were some people that were actually catching sharks in the Red Sea. And we wanted to expose that. So I took this picture of Jeannie, the shark lady on the left, David, the photographer on the right. 
photographing sharks on a hook, very sad. Also this picture of a genie who was quite petite uh, next to a hammerhead shark. Anyway, we managed to succeed. And with these pictures and with that story, we got um, that, that shark operation kicked out. This was the story that came out in the sharks, magnificent and misunderstood. Also another story we did was called flashlight fish. These are little lights like fireflies that light up in the sea, fish that light up in the sea. And this is one of several stories we did together. This connection with National Geographic and this team was uh, immensely important to us. It gave us the, the ability to, you know, be in the world, you know. We were a bunch of kids out in the, the desert, you know. And here we had these great artists and scientists working with us. Anyway, through the work of the hard work of the, uh, the Nature Society people of the Sinai um, and the understanding, I must say, of the government, they set up nature reserves all along the Sinai and Ross Muhammad being the, the key one where they prohibited shell collecting, coral collecting, fishing, anything that would harm uh, leave footprints and not anything else. Um, and I took Jeannie to see this at the time. Jeannie never forgave me for this picture because I'm like lecturing her with my finger. I don't, not being very di diplomatic. But with all of this action and, and activity and uh, National Geographic, we, we got the attention of the world and film teams and, and our um, other photographers and writers wanted to get bound. And uh, we were contacted by the publisher of Skin Diver Magazine, which was the leading magazine in the diving world at the time. Paul, Paul Simolis was his name. And he wanted to send his editor, Jack McKinney, to do a story, the first ever movie on, the, on diving tourism in the Red Sea. And he asked if we could take care of it. And we took care of it. And uh, I'm, I have a few film clips. Once again, I'm sharing with you. This thing's going back 40 years. So it might bounce a little bit. I apologize. Bear with me. And I hope you, at least it's just, it's just the beginning of it. Became part of this holy land that has also been of immense historical importance throughout the pages of history. And this is the 23,000 square miles of Sinai Peninsula. In the north, one finds an endless desert plain. And to the south, a great mountain range reaching deep into Saudi Arabia, across Sinai, and thence to Nubia on the African continent. Relics of destruction dot the landscape, stark reminders of the pathos and futility of war. Yet, in sharp contrast to this parched desert land, Snuggling up against its shoreline is a body of water, just 20 million years old, young by geological standards, but so filled with wonderful and amazing sights, it is considered a mecca for sport divers. This is God's other world, the Red Sea. So that was the first film. That film made the circuit. It went all around the United States, also around the world. And it was a big boost for diving tourism into the Red Sea, I'll say. Um, it was also very helpful to have other points of interest and beauty in the Sinai uh, for the tourists to visit. So one of the main attractions was St. Catherine's Monastery. It has an amazing history going back to the seventh century, but um, the mother of Constantine, Helena, uh, converted to Christianity and set up this monastery in the, at the base of Mount Sinai. Biblical Mount Sinai. So it was an attraction, but I'm explaining it because it became a dive site, at least a personal one for me, because there was a flood up in the Sinai at the time in 1975, and they needed a diver to go and repair or pull out a, a, a pump. So the pump was in a well. The well was giving fresh water to the monastery and to the ranger station there and they needed a diver to go go down there and cut the lines of the well uh, uh, the pump and and extra extract it 
I would, I, in, in retrospect, I would say this idiot agreed to be the diver. So I went uh, with family, with my baby daughter, who was one year old at the time, Ayelet, and Sharon, my wife, and we went into the Jeep and we took our gear. And I, I went down that well to do the work. And I almost ended up in that well without leaving, without leaving it alive. But that's another story for another time. But um, I had a good support team. They took very care of me. You could see the pulley and the Jeep, that was to pull me up, to let me down with these guys. And, I just had to hope they were strong enough to hold on to my body and my tank as going down. <clears throat> anyway, we were successful. The pump came up. It's next to my left leg here. But mostly the success was my technical support team here. We all got together for a picture um, just to celebrate our success. Shipwrecks. Shipwrecks, they're one of the more wonderful things in the diving world. They're a time capsule. Depending when the ship went down, you could discover things about them, how people lived. Um, but also they're immensely beautiful because they become a base for life, fish life, coral life. But we had a problem in the Red Sea at the time. We didn't have a shipwreck. Um, there was a movie called The Deep, which had just come out about um, in the Caribbean, it was an old story. Beautiful Jacqueline Bissett in a wet t-shirt did wonders for tourism and diving the, uh, the Rhone wreck in, uh, in the Virgin Islands. We didn't have that and we were going crazy. All of our wrecks at the time were going up on the reef and sitting there and sitting there for years until they just uh, became you know, fossils like you see here an early wreck, a steamer that had sunk, that went aground and I think in the late 1920s and that was all that was left of it. Now these ships look very similar because they're just skeletons. The sea is very fierce. And we needed a real shipwreck because we wanted to advertise the shipwreck. So first of all, some of them partially sank. This is the Yolanda Ras Muhammad. We were sure we were gonna get a treasure there. The biggest treasure we found were toilet seats. And Jeannie Clark sat on one of them for this uh, photo op. She's not the first and probably not the last. Um, but we needed a real wreck and we were getting desperate. We even made up a story. We, we comprised the story and the story was ready before the wreck was found because we wanted to bring tourism, sorry. So we made up a story about Lawrence of Arabia and gold and treasures and the whole thing, you know, and we didn't have a wreck, but we befriended the Bedouin fishermen who were working that area. And they told us about what they think might be a ship at the base of the reef out in the Suez. And I said, well, can you, where's the chart? Where's the map, what chart, what map? They said, go around the corner, Ras Muhammad, head into the sunset and smoke two cigarettes and you'll see a reef in the middle of the sea. Go to the end of the reef and go in the water. So the first problem was I used to smoke a pipe and then I had to do a conversion. Two cigarettes, one pipe bowl, how does that work? <clears throat> Eventually, we went out there, a group of Americans, and I told him we're going on an exploration dive. And lo and behold, following his instructions, as we got out into the Suez, at the far point on this horizon, you see a reef. And as soon as I got there and I jumped in the water, it was a, I found the ship, a ship. We didn't know the name of the ship at the time. We found out later, it's the Dunraven. And Subsequently, we got everybody excited because we had, the, we had the story. It wasn't exactly the right story, but we had a story and we had a wreck. Uh, we, we convinced the BBC to come out and do a BBC special on this wreck. And mind you, this is just the beginning of the, 
what became known as the peace process between Israel and Egypt. So there was behind the scenes things going on, meetings and discussions and even signatures, which would ultimately return the Sinai to Egyptian sovereignty for peace, something that we believed in, very important. So I'm gonna show you a little clip that was shot at that time by BBC about the Dunraven wreck and some of the action that was going on at the time in real life. It's, it's pretty amazing. And also some of the tensions too. So there's gonna be one wreck, one clip after another. There's no time to waste. The waters where the wreck lies beyond Ras Mohammed Point may soon be handed back to Egypt and word that the wreck may be Lawrence's gold ship from 1917 is luring other divers from as far away as Germany and Sweden. It's attracted the United States ambassador, Sam Lewis, too. Straight from the latest peace talks. Good morning. How are Welcome you? home. Thank you. <laughs> How are you? Oh, fine. I did the dirty, dirty deed yesterday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What'd you do? Well, you gave it away. You gave it away. Uh, now listen, but you know, you know, listen, you know, it's two and a half hours late finishing. You heard that. What, what, what That's was That's why reason? I got here at two o'clock in the morning. It was on the radio, though. What was I what spent was... two and a half hours trying to persuade them. Ras Muhammad. To stick the line a little further west. <laughs> did you? Did you I succeed? Did. No, I failed. You failed. But I really worked at it. Two and a half hours, you know, we had uh, 200 people sitting out there waiting for the ceremony, and the sun was getting lower in the west. And there I was arguing for your damn dive sites. And it didn't work. Well, you know, uh, Maybe we'll get it next time. Yeah, you think so? But did it go okay? I mean, we were pretty, you know, I mean, in the end, it worked out okay? No, it worked out fine. Yeah? We had to talk to Sadat and to Begin on the phone and straighten out a few last-minute problems. Really? You think I'll be able to operate? For three years, anyway. For three? <laughs> <laughs> that was Ambassador Samuel Lewis. I just want to say a word about him before we move to the next clip. He was the United States ambassador during that whole peace process, but he was also an avid diver and a lover of nature. And Ambassador Lewis was perhaps, I don't want to say singularly responsible, extremely responsible um, for preserving the continuation of nature protection and, and, um, and diving, as was Dr. Eugenie Clark, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, he was a dear friend, a student. I taught him how to dive, and he helped me immensely, and, and sadly, he left us a few years ago, and, and he's forever missed. This is a little... Next day, on the trip out to the reef, a brisk reminder of local tensions. Stop taking photographs. If you don't want to be photographed, go away. I'm going to confiscate your camera. These waters may soon belong to Egypt, but right now they're as secure as the Israeli Navy can make them. Everything we film will be checked by the sensor. There are Navy people here too, so don't get excited. I only want your details. If you don't want to be photographed, clear off. You don't tell me when to go. You are only the Navy. Guard us. Don't interfere with us. Speer thinks the Navy are overdoing it, and he points this out to them. I personally will see you get into trouble. It looks like a nice, peaceful area, but it's full of action. Lawrence was a spy, they thought that we are spies, you know, all the time. Anyway, I, I apologize, we have a feeling that maybe some of the audio was not great there but it was about the tensions that were happening in this area in the Suez Gulf. There were people that were determined to, to um, uh, how would you say, sabotage the peace process and there was terror, um, threats of terror and the Navy was there to protect the area and we were showing up there um, looking for shipwrecks and sometimes there was a little tension, but we got over it and we moved on as we always do. Um, anyway, 
we were hoping also for Lawrence's gold treasure, which we had put up in our May created in our mind. All we got was the kitchen sink and a few other things, but a great story to tell and a, an amazing, wonderful wife, uh, dive site for, for, for people to enjoy. We also um, did the first IMAX underwater film, um, the big IMAX productions, and that was shot the first one ever in Sharm el Sheikh with our uh, boat, and that's the camera. It's huge, huge camera. Uh, Chuck Nicklin, my dear friend from San Diego, who uh, I think is watching now, was the cameraman on this one, and he did an amazing job. And it was the first IMAX called Nomads of the Deep, also filmed in Hawaii, in Maui. So we had a town called Ophira, beautiful setting, just above the water on a cliff, just below the mountains of the Sinai, and that's where we lived in the, after we moved out of the trailer. Uh, we had a beautiful new diving center, which was um, right on the beach where the, the train car was moved over here as a storeroom. You can see the hotel to the right, and this was our diving center. And then something very dramatic happened. Peace was in the air. And the great Egyptian president Sadat and the great Israeli prime minister Begin got together and finally put a peace treaty together between the two countries. A, a, a great thing. Now, obviously it, it had repercussions for us in the area, but I think for the most part, we all supported it. They came in 1981 to Sharm. They had a summit meeting next door to my diving center. Um, it was, the, my diving center was right behind there. They needed chairs and, and a table for the summit meeting. It's almost embarrassing to see them sitting, these two great world leaders sitting on my straw chairs and, and at, on the table there, but that was the Sinai, it was pretty funky. But they did this meeting, it was a photo op, and peace moved forward. And there was a new era, very exciting. And we supported it, like I said. Um, and the diving world responded with a lot of question marks. What's going to be? I mean, up until that point, things were great. They had great diving services, great sites, good laws, controls, uh, recompression chambers, security clinics, the beginning of hotels. And now who knew what was going to be? It was a, a, a period of question. Anyway, the international media came after the diving media and covered this period. And we were kind of a focal point of it. And I'm gonna show you two quick clips, one from ABC television, which is a little more personal. And the other one was something that I put together with 60 Minutes about conservation. Here we go. reefs, clear waters, and infinite variety of sea life with strict laws prohibiting fishing and even the collecting of seashells. Rosenstein helped build the tourist industry by developing a scuba diving business now worth over a half million dollars. We're dealing with, in this area, immediate area, about 20,000 divers a year. And it's a fair, you know, multi-million dollar tourist enterprise. And uh, it has every capability of achieving a pe potential that will rival the, maybe the areas on the Riviera or the Caribbean. Thus, the economic as well as personal loss will be enormous. Rosenstein has dual Israeli-American citizenship. His three children were born here, and he wants to stay if the Egyptians will allow it. Uh, it would be a shame if it becomes a, an area of political uh, 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 dominoes, you know, or checkers, where people move people around and in and out and things like that. There aren't many places in the world you can slap an air bottle on your back, go down 30 feet or so, and watch the sharks go by. In fact, just about the only place you can do it with some hope of living to tell the story is in the Red Sea off Ras Muhammad, the southernmost tip of the Sinai. And even here, divers are afraid they might not be able to do it much longer. The sharks living off the coral reefs here are among the most accessible in the world to scientists, to photographers, to intrepid divers. 
Up until now, at least, they've been very friendly. But this whole area, all of the Sinai, is in the midst of a political transition right now, and believe it or not, the sharks are caught up in it. For the last 12 years, the sharks have been swimming in Israeli waters. They're about to become Egyptian. Anwar Sadat is gradually regaining control of the entire desert and its territorial waters. Israel is giving up what it conquered by force and what it learned to love and protect. The Israeli occupation may have been controversial politically, but ecologically it was a masterpiece. The Israelis set up nature reserves. They passed and enforced tough legislation protecting wildlife on the sands and in the sea. As Americans were instrumental in orchestrating the peace between Egypt and Israel, Americans are getting involved now in pressing for continued conservation, particularly of the magnificent coral reefs off Ras Muhammad. Marine biologist Dr. Eugenia Clark, professor of zoology at the University of Maryland, is spearheading a campaign aimed at convincing Sadat that what he's getting under these waters is worth taking care of. The Egyptians don't have a, co a conservation program developed yet. They are very much aware of the problem and they're starting to develop it, but they're like just infants in this field and the Israelis have really worked out all the problems. They don't allow spear fishing, they don't allow um, any abuse of the reefs and marine life because people come out here and they think each person wants to take back one shell, one piece of coral, one shell. They think, what harm is that? But when you get thousands of people coming to one area and, and picking off the prettiest shells and corals, you have nothing left in no time. I think it's the most beautiful place in the whole world. Dr. Clark went to Cairo recently to take her case to the president. Sadat responded by sending a small team of Egyptian officials, scientists, and scholars to Ras Muhammad, the first such trip made overland in almost 25 years. They were subjected to three days of well-intentioned Israeli propaganda on how they, the Egyptians, should take care of their land in their Straits of Tehran, where Egyptian guns once threatened Israeli shipping and triggered two wars. It was a quiet exercise in normalization, diving diplomacy, the message from Israelis to Egyptians, if you don't control and restrict developers, fishermen, tourists, and divers, the incredible underwater world here can disappear within a few months. Like any world leader, Anwar Sadat receives a lot of petitions. Here's a lot of pleas. This is one he probably hasn't heard before. Save the sharks. Bob Simon, CBS News, in the Red Sea. Okay, so that kind of gives you a feeling of what it was at that time, running a diving business, trying to have people come in and, and knowing uh, perhaps, you know, sadly that you're going to be leaving maybe at some point. We didn't really know what was going to be. Um, I had the pleasure and the honor to be chosen as kind of a spokesman of the local industry, of the diving industry, um, to, to plead the case of A, continued operations in the area, uh, and B, the continued protection of the area. And um, Jeannie was in Cairo. She met with, uh, by chance, the, the son of Sadat, who then took her to meet with her, his father. And he gave his vehicles to this group of uh, officials and scientists from Egypt to come for the first time back to the Sinai in 25 years. And, um, or, actually it was 13 years or something, and, um, and be able to see the area. And I gave them a talk about it, and this was at the diving center. Then they, with the uh, military officials, uh, I went with maps and went over the area of the dive sites, and I like to believe made some kind of a contribution to laying out the, the blueprint for what was gonna be after 1982. Um, I also went to Cairo and I, on the, as a guest of the American Embassy there, and I gave a presentation at the United States Cultural Center, and I met with the um, Egyptian diving community, the young people of divers that, like us that were diving in Egypt, and I gave a presentation about the area that they were soon to inherit with a big plea, once again, of nature conservation, and I managed to get an invitation of one of their leaders, one of the pioneers of of diving in Egypt, uh, a gentleman named Ayman Taher, who became a very close and dear friend. And I got permission for him to come to the Sinai during the Israeli period. 
and to see for himself and to get, you know, basically to say, listen, you, you got to be the guy who's going to take over. And this is up to you now, you know. And, and he did a great job. Anyway, in 1982, April, Israel left the Sinai. This was the cover. There was a story of National Geographic. It was supposed to be the cover. But in Poland, they had a coup, Lech Valencia, if you remember, and the whole thing, the crumbling of the Iron Curtain. So we got bounced into second slot. But in the article, they talked about, first of all, something very significant and symbolic was the taking apart of the military bases that were Israelis had advanced uh, air, air, air force bases that were taken apart, a part of the peace. And that's beautiful. They also covered my diving center and talked about me and my family. So there's the diving center in the middle of the picture here. Take a look, this Israeli soldier is still protecting because there were still threats of terror. Look at the mountain here in the distance and that's the bay and the beach pretty empty. Later we'll visit it and you'll see what's happened since. This is a family portrait of uh, Sharon, my wife, and two of our three kids at the time. We now have four. Um, snorkeling at, at one of the reefs. And it's packing up and moving out. That was the military base of Sharm. Ras Muhammad was here. Every morning I sit, stand next to this wall and drink coffee. And now we were going to be leaving and we didn't know what was going to be really. But we had hopes that we would be able to return. <clears throat> anyway, this is the peace poster of the Sinai at the time. At the, at the very tip is Ras Muhammad. The Tehran Straits are here and Sharm is here. I decided to give it a chance. I went to the States. There was a Dima show at the time. <clears throat> in, I was actually in Texas. And I was interviewed and by the local paper. And this was the story of me trying to be able to continue operation in the Sinai. OK, now I have a, I, I'm throwing out a theoretical question to you. It's, we're about an hour into this thing. I have more to do. This is like phase one, Red Sea divers in the Sinai. I go into phase two, which is fantasy cruises and my liveaboard operations all over the Red Sea. And if if it's okay, I'll continue. But I just, uh, Elon, what do you think? Should we do it another time or continue on? No, no, you can go ahead. I think it is uh, so interesting that you can uh, simply do your thing and everybody will uh, <clears throat> listen. It's amazing, Alon. Okay. Is that okay? I hope so. <clears throat> I also apologize for my throat. I have a little bit of a froggy throat tonight, um, and I'm not going to stop talking. Okay, so the next phase is moving from a land-based operation in Sharm el-Sheikh and in Eilat, where I had a diving operation, to a liveaboard diving operation, which we named Fantasy Cruises. And that began in 1983. We wanted to make a fantasy of the Red Sea, so to speak. Um, I bought an old mo uh, motor yacht, a uh, wooden teak yacht, which we named Fantasy One. This is a shot of it in one of the more beautiful spots, the Marsa Bareka. Remember where the tanks were in the beginning? That's the same place, beautiful place. Um, and a few years later, actually 10 years later, I bought the second vessel called the Fantasy II, which is um, probably it was at the time, one of the most luxurious, if not the most luxurious live aboard uh, boat working in the diving industry. And um, we were very, very proud of it. It was uh, 115 feet, 35 meters ocean going. Um, very, very comfortable, as you can see. We needed a big crew. It was a big boat. You can see we had like nine crew for 12 guests. It was like Monaco divers, taking people diving like five star. Uh, very different from the beginning days of, of fantasy. Um, or Red Sea Divers or whatever. This was the owner's cabin 
uh, of a liveaboard dive boat. Um, one of the groups was led by a guy named Stan Waterman, one, one of the greats of the diving industry, pioneer. And he brought a group over and he ended up in the owner's cabin. And I asked him the next morning, so Stan, what do you think of the, of the owner's cabin? And he said, Howard, it's embarrassingly luxurious. And I always enjoyed using that quote. Also the food we were very proud of. We had great chefs. This is Netta who was with us for many years. And basically, you know, the choice at the time was lobster or fish, uh, strictly kosher, of course. Um, we actually probably are the first liveaboard or ever maybe that got a write up in Gourmet Magazine. The Patricia Wells, who was the food writer for the New York Times, uh, International Herald Tribune and Gourmet was on one of our trips and just was blown away by the food and sat with Netta every evening writing down recipes and came out with an article about the food on the fan. Sometimes the food was so good that the guests didn't even have strength to go diving after that. So they just, they just uh, chilled out on the deck. With these larger vessels, we were able to go farther afield. This is now we're going into the 1990s. So, you know, we started with a little a Jeep and a little boat just diving around the bay. Here we're going deeper into the Red Sea, Southern Egypt, some of the great dive sites in the world, the Brothers Island, this is 1991, 1990. Uh, Daedalus Reef, another submerged coral reef in the middle of the Red Sea, just a lighthouse there, um, that's it. But the diving spectacular, Zabargat Island, also just uh, near the, the border with, um, with Sudan and also amazing diving. As we got more adventurous and all of a sudden also something happened in the region, it was called the Gulf War and tensions were very, very taut again, like a roller coaster. And the Egyptian uh, Air Force came by and literally was harassing our boat off of one of the dive sites. And actually coming into one of the sites, um, we actually en encountered gunfire and yours truly was arrested and brought to the shore um, where I'm here actually under speedo arrest. Um, luckily I was able to grab a, my little radio and notify the ambassador, or get the word to the ambassador up in Tel Aviv. And he got to the ambassador in Cairo. And within a few hours, I was back on the boat, but it was a little tense. We decided to go farther afield. If things were tight there, we saw maybe going south, we could find more interesting diving and be less hassled. And I convinced once again, the Dubalais to, to, to make a trip down the entire Red Sea. This had never been done before. To start in the north and go all the way through Bab el Mandab Straits into Djibouti, diving all the way. And we call that the Rainbow Expedition. And it was unique of its kind. Starting up here a lot, Sharm el Sheikh, going along the whole Egyptian coast, along the whole Sudanese coast, past Eritrea and coming out in Djibouti, diving all the way, and sometimes in Yemen, and sometimes in places we shouldn't have been. But it was very exciting, very successful, until we hit a bad storm, one trip, and went aground off of Sudan. If some of you saw the movie uh, Red Sea Diving Resort recently on Netflix, right there. We went aground before the, these guys were there <clears throat> and we had Israelis on board and we're in Sudan and it was pretty tense. And um, the Israeli Air Force did the largest air sea rescue operation ever on a Sikorsky helicopters refueling with Hercules planes, very dramatic, pulled the guests off the boat. Ultimately we pulled the boat off, got it, and you'll see the rest, but hopefully none of you will ever finish a diving trip 
this in this fashion. But then again, if you don't leave the port, I mean, if you stay in port, you'll never have an accident. That's for sure. We were part of a pioneering operation and today people are diving there all the time. So we had a trudge back to Haifa. We got the boat into dry dock, um, a massive repair job um, and got the thing as soon as we can, we got back in the water. We had a big assignment coming up in National Geographic and the Seychelles. And we made the long trip all the way down the Red Sea, once again, through the Straits of uh, Bab el Mandab, into the Indian Ocean, diving in Socotra Island, and then down to the Seychelles, which became for several years a base of operations for us during the winter months. And we, we learned to love this beautiful area our home base was Mahi in the Seychelles, the, the main island. There's the fantasy, a little different see, uh, scenery than what we had in the Sinai. Amazing blue, co cobalt blue waters, beautiful beaches. The main islands were, the diving was nice. It was not Red Sea diving, but if you got farther away, farther and farther away into the atolls, the um, volcanic atolls, not the granitic, granitic inner islands, you found some world-class diving. And so we proposed to open up an operation at a world heritage site called Aldabra, one of the truly great places in the world. I can't say enough about it, and I won't talk that much more about it, but I'll show you just the beginning of a clip that we did. This was made by John Boyle, a dear friend of mine, who came out with the National Geographic Expedition led by David Dubelay to do a story about this unique and remote place. Remote being a thousand kilometers, 600 miles away from the main island in the middle of the Mozambique Channel, just above Madagascar. We used them um, initially, by the way, before we did this, the plane of the president of the Seychelles just to do the survey. And this is the lagoon, the world's largest coral atoll right in the middle of the Indian Ocean. This was the team that did the job. David in the middle there. I'm over here on the left. And some of the world's best underwater photographers uh, were on this trip. This was the story in National Geographic, and this is the video. Lying at the northern end of the Mozambique Channel, Aldabra, the remotest island of the Seychelles archipelago, lies 600 miles southwest of the main island of Mahe. Our vessel, the Fantasy, a specially equipped dive boat purpose built for expeditions of this sort, and usually based in the Red Sea, has already made the arduous journey down the East African coast to Port Victoria to refuel and take on supplies for the final leg of the expedition. On board is a team of some of the world's top underwater photographers and writers who aim to become the first to explore and record Aldabra's unique underwater mysteries since Jacques Cousteau visited the atoll 40 years ago. The only port of entry to the Seychelles in order to comply with immigration formalities is Victoria, on the main island of Mahe. Howard Rosenstein, the owner of the Fantasy, obtains port clearance from the harbour authorities at Victoria, and we prepare to cast off. On board, the crew carry out their last-minute preparation for this five-week exploration, and the expedition members carry out last-minute equipment checks. David Dubelay, National Geographic's underwater contract photographer, has traveled to many of the world's most obscure. So we were in the Indian Ocean. We were working off of Aldabra. We did it for seven years. It was some of the most exciting times of my life, I must say. And I yearn to get back there someday. We had some other bizarre um, expeditions that we did. One of them was uh, with a group called the Century Club. These are people who are in a club that basically collect stamps on their passports going all around the world to the most exotic and remote places. And the, the countries they visit are, have a, a, a rating, a number, one to 10 or something. The, the hardest to get to and the most valued is the British Indian Ocean's territory, 
a very, very remote speck in the Indian Ocean where Diego Garcia is located. That's the big American base, but you can't go there. But these three people were willing to pay all money to be able to have their passport stamped by our captain. They went three days from the Seychelles into terrible seas. They were in their rooms, they hardly even ate. They got to the island, they went ashore. We took out our finest plastic cups, poured sparkling wine into them, they took a drink. We stamped their passports, took the picture and three days back, I, I don't want to tell you how difficult it was for them, but they got the stamp and at the next convention of the Century Club, they were the stars. Another kind of neat project we did was with BBC in Madagascar. Um, we took the boat there from Aldabra, it wasn't that far, to the north end of Madagascar, very beautiful area, very um, remote. The town is called Hellville, and sadly, it's very similar to the name. But we had to go in there for port clearance, and then we picked up a very famous actress and the team, the film crew, Joanna Lumley, British actress, uh, star of growth, a star of uh, Ab Fab and Avengers. And this series was going to be called Girl Friday. It was a takeoff on um, Robinson Crusoe. She was going to be shipwrecked on this remote island off of Madagascar and surviving on her own for a week or so. And they used our boat as a base. And this is Madagascar. This is a small island called Sara Bajina. I'm convinced that nobody had been diving there before us. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure. So while she was on the island surviving, we were off with the dinghy diving and having a hell of a great time. Anyway, <clears throat> at this point, we decided to go back we had to go back to the Red Sea and see what was going on over there. We were surprised what we saw. After a few years, things really took off. And uh, hundreds of dive boats, hundreds of hotels, literally, were in the area that we had left years before. And if you remember this picture from 1978, the Bay of Naaman and our diving center, 20 years later, it looked like this. And that's 23 years ago. And I must tell you, it's much more developed now. Sadly, going through very difficult times because of obvious reasons. But we figured that was about it for our type of operation. We were a cutting edge operation. We weren't, nobody was gonna come on the big luxurious liveaboard and have five day boats anchored all around them. So in a sense of deja vu, I headed back from the Red Sea to the Holy Land, uh, like one of my forefathers and started looking for a new life. The days of liveaboard, the days of diving centers were over for me. I wanted to spend more time with my family also, and now four children, and I decided to look for other projects. One thing I did briefly, but I'm very proud of, was led a group of people who created and developed and patented a new diving mask called the Pro Ear, which seriously protects the ears of many divers and saved the diving career of many professional divers. I'm very happy about that. Shortly after that, I began a new project, this time with my eldest son, Nadav, called Fantasy Line. And this was following a passion of mine of underwater photography. And this was to create and make affordable underwater photo products. Up until then, up until the digital age, underwater photography was a very elitist thing. It literally cost thousands of dollars to be properly suited for underwater photography. With digital photography changed all that. Um, and we were at the forefront of that, and this is 20 years ago. So I started out with very basic equipment that we were manufacturing in China, using our expertise, whatever we had, and 
We had a lot to learn. The ultimate test always fell on our chief tester because without his approval, nothing went forward. But we grew and we grew, developed a great team. This is our A team. My son, Nadav, who is the, now the CEO of the company and doing an amazing job. Gary Fishman, myself, kind of the senior guy that gets in everybody's way. Ron Verrett, who runs the operation in North America. Sharon Reines Choval, who does everything and also made this PowerPoint. And Sharon, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Boaz Samurai, our chief tester, diver professional, fantastic guy. <clears throat> I'm taking a break. I'll go with soda now. I'm sorry. Anyway, this is a film made with our products. Just to give you an idea of what you can do with a compact really once again sincerely about the audio on this thing and it, it, I, I really wish it was better and maybe in the YouTube version it will be better and then we could share it online. Uh, I just wanted to say before we continue that uh, most of that was filmed using a camera that you could put in your pocket and it is eight nine hundred dollar camera with a fantasy housing and lighting and you can take great stuff. Anyway, we're getting towards the end. And I just wanna say a few words about the interesting things that were involved in my career and some of the interesting people I met and I can't do justice in this time, but a few people that, Maestro Leonard Bernstein was a regular in our diving center in Charm. He loved diving, he loved getting away. Um, from the, the fame and glory and whatever of his life and just hanging out with us in Charm he came often. I have many Lenny stories, but I won't go into now, but he was really a character. Ja, um, Hans Haas, who was the, the one of the great pioneers of diving, uh, Austrian gentleman um, on, on the level of Jacques Cousteau, came to dive with us at Ras Muhammad, a great honor. My dear friend, Samuel Lewis, ambassador, who did so much to make sure that the transition from Israel to Egypt and diving would continue, forever grateful. Ambassador Thomas Pickering, who followed him in Israel and then went on to the UN and was a diving buddy of mine and continued to make sure that we can continue diving and the area would be continue to be protected. There was quite a few astronauts who somehow have a relationship with the sea. 
Uh, Jim Irwin was an Apollo astronaut, came to dive with us with a very interesting expedition looking for the chariots of Moses. That's another story, maybe another, another time. Buzz Aldrin, a friend and a diving partner, came diving with us in the Red Sea not so long ago, and it was a great honor to dive with Buzz. Barbara Walters, the newscaster, the TV personality, came out to dive with us. Dr. Sylvia Earle, her deepness, one of the leading advocates of marine ecology and nature protection in the world today, an amazing, inspirational human being, uh, shared some time with us in the Red Sea a little over a year ago. And then again, my mentor, dear friend, Dr. Eugenie Clark, the shark lady, who taught me so much about the sea and uh, missing her sincerely. Her book, by the way, her memoirs are coming out next month, which I highly recommend. This is a scoop. This is the cover of the, her new book. Dr. Jose Castro put it together. He's watching us right now from Florida. Hi, Jose. You did a great job on this. I was happy to make a small contribution about one of my heroes, uh, Dr. Eugenie Clark. Also, Jeannie's daughter, Aya, is watching from Sarasota, and I wish you all the best, too. Anyway, just in closing, and we're really getting to the end, nothing would happen without the Fantasy family. And these are my beautiful family. Um, all of them have grown up now. Um, the youngest one sitting on my lap is now 35 years old. Um, I don't want to embarrass any of them, so I won't talk about them too much. Um, that's my lovely wife, Sharon, a diving instructor of her own right. And that's to thank them for making this all possible. Um, now I would like to just share with you one final short clip. I hope it comes out okay. In, in 2009, I was inducted into the International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame, a great, great honor uh, because it's selected by peers and this is for my contributions for diving tourism into the Red Sea. Howard Rosenstein, at the young age of 19, had his first sight of the Red Sea and it captured his heart. By 1970, he and his wife, Sharon, opened their first dive center along Israel's Mediterranean coast, followed by one of the very first diving operations along the Sinai coast of the Red Sea. In 1973, they moved Red Sea divers to a beautiful bay in Sharm El Sheikh at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, lodged in a primitive but functional abandoned railroad car. Howard led divers from the entire world, transporting them in army surplus jeeps and small boats. Howard and Sharon started promoting, and before long, Red Sea Divers was hosting scientific dive teams, countless film crews, diving personalities, and underwater photographers from across the globe. They were thrilled as Howard willingly showed them the underwater wonders of his Red Sea. Howard was selected to plead the case for Sinai Reef Protection. He worked closely with the U.S. Ambassador to Israel to secure nature conservation and maintain diving tourism in the Red Sea. When Israel withdrew from the Sinai in 1982, Howard and Sharon moved on to establish Fantasy Cruises, the first liveaboard operation in the Red Sea. Rapid success and expanding interest in Red Sea diving prompted Howard to purchase the larger, luxurious Fantasy II in 1990. This liveaboard vessel explored the entire Red Sea and the Indian Ocean atolls. After 25 years of continuous operation, three wars, and two national administrations, Howard and Sharon shut down their dive travel operation. Determined to stay in the dive industry, Howard formed Fantasy Line, manufacturing and distributing underwater photo solutions. We pay tribute to Howard, the ambassador of Red Sea Diving, for generously sharing his underwater world. Mm -hmm.